So if you can just say what your name is. My name is Hazel Bartram Birchinoff. Okay. And today's date is the 15th of October 2019. Don't you want to sit there? No. Okay. okay. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, then before you answer, <coughs> just leave a couple of seconds so that, you know, there's a clean edit. That's good, because it'll give me time to think. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. So, where were you born? I was born in Leicestershire, in a little town called Ashby, in the little hospital there. But I grew up in Colville. We lived in a two-up, two-down terraced house to begin with when I was very small, um, in the back streets of Colville, a place called Gutteridge Street, which I always loved that name. And then we went to Beaver Road when I was quite small, where my parents had a little shop, which was a greengrocer and floristry shop, in the centre square. And it was a great place to grow up there. And then I moved to Ashby. Later. And um, your family? Did you have any brothers, sisters? Yeah, I had, I had a, a, I do have <laughs> a brother and a sister. Um, my brother is a musician and he conducted brass bands and we played together as kids a lot. We played duets and also quartets. We were both in the National Youth Brass Band. And also um, we were with William Davis Constructive Band, which was a wonderful brass band to be in because we got through to the national finals. And I was one of three girls who ever got to play on the stage at the championship section there. I nearly got my teeth in there, championship section. <laughs> and it was fabulous uh, to do something like that. I ended up on the front of the national newspapers as a result of that. My sister, she played horn and she was really interested in lots of different kinds of music as well. My dad was into music, but neither of my parents played, but my dad was in a choir. So there's loads of music in the house, all the time. It was fun actually going to Liverpool. Um, from the word go, I liked it. It wasn't just the fact that the Beatles had been there, although that was quite a big thing for me. It was that the culture there was so rich and the art college itself was full of really interesting students and tutors that I talked to when, on the day that we visited. And I just knew that I wanted to be there. Did you go to the art school with the intention of being in a band or was that um, a coincidence that John interviewed you? I think that to me, art and music are the same thing. And I think that I needed to do art because I'd grown up and that was kind of my own personal work. But my group work was always with friends who are musicians. And I'd, I'd grown up with that since I, I was about seven. And I wanted to carry on that way of life. So when the deaf school thing came up as well, I kind of, I knew I'd be looking for bands. And I played with other bands that I was in when I was in Liverpool. I played with the Edgehill Players, who were fantastic. Dave Saunders, my tutor in art and the painting school, he was in that. And he put me in touch with the Majorca Orchestra and the Portsmouth Symphonia. And then I ended up playing with them as well. So it all led on from there. And I knew that I would be doing music. So did you go to art school as a route through to a musical career, would you say? I've always done art and music together. They're the same thing for me. Um, most people who I'm involved with are very creative. So things like opera are really important to me. I've been part of opera groups and I've sang solos and lead roles in operas and put done the stage and costume design. And I've worked with my students to develop design in that way when I've taught in colleges and universities. So I've kind of, you know, developed a whole way of working that goes across curriculums all the time. Some of my favourite musicians when I was a kid was uh, Dusty Springfield, big time. Um, Roxy Music, Brian Ferry, 
David Bowie, big time as well. Um, it was their ability to perform, but also to have great music at the same time, with quite a lot of humour and ability to have... It wasn't just charisma, because that sort of sounds like just gloss, but power on stage, having a very, very strong stage presence. I like to talk about the College of Ideas, because that comes up in both art and music. It can come up in theatre and dance as well, any kind of art. But it, it's basically putting together different parts of culture, different kinds of cultures, different kinds of colours, ways of being, different processes, like putting together rock music with classical music, with jazz, with opera, with huge numbers of different kinds of ways of thinking and working. And I think that's what the Beatles managed to achieve. I think John Martin had a huge effect on him. And I think Paul was able to pick it up particularly, for instance, like in Penny Lane, when all of a sudden he, he had got this beautiful bark piece coming through on a tiny trumpet. Those kinds of crisp ideas next to rock music next to Ringo singing rowdy football kind of songs with lots of humour, next to John coming up with tonnes of humour and ideas around being naughty and a bit of a cad. The whole character of the music was filled with colour and form and interesting things that were full of content, lots and lots of ideas that really meant something to people. And I think that's why they were so successful. I think when I go into spaces, I can often feel who's been there. I think it's something that all of us have a real intense feeling about, particularly if you're in a life room. There's an intensity in the atmosphere that builds because you have a group of people who are concentrating for such long periods of time. And I remember thinking about John Lennon being on the stairs and walking down the stairs, or even falling down the stairs, I heard once he did. And I remember hearing about so many really creative people in the building and knowing that that was happening, that that had happened and was going to happen in that space. It was such a creative space. I remember the first rehearsal that we had at Duskall. It was in the basement. And there was at least 12 people in the band, all completely different characters, having a whale of a time. And tons of friends hanging out there. So it's like a social evening together. And I felt out of it because they'd, a lot of them, they'd learnt the words and the music. And I was running to catch up. And I was like the youngest. I'd only just arrived. They'd been around for a year or so. And so I, I really had to do some work to catch up. And we went, oh, we did tons of gigs actually at the beginning that were local. And then I remember we went to the Milkweg Club which was in Amsterdam, and that was amazing. Um, we had four days there, and during that time, I couldn't do all the songs. I, I played my horn and I did a bit of singing on some of the songs, but some of them I knew I'd got to somehow sit out. I didn't quite know what to do. So what I did, I, I sat at a table, because I used to smoke then, naughty, naughty, smoke with a long cigarette holder, reading a newspaper while all this was going on. And people thought it was performance art, but it was really just necessary. I think what's unique about being in an art school band is the plethora of ideas. Everybody who gets into art school has to be an idea maker. And they're clutching and catching things from all over the place, from all cultures, from anything around them, and they bring them all together, and then they try and work something out. And they pick out what they really like. And within art schools, you're made to be open-minded. You don't have any choice. You have to be a cultural worker. So you get people who really know their ropes. And of course, they're going to come up with brand new ideas, which is really exciting for the pop industry. So that's how it works. The Melody Maker contest was a really big deal. Because I'd been through contests before. It had been, you know, we'd end up at the national finals 
at the uh, Royal Albert Hall, or there'd be local contests that were really big deals locally. And so I was kind of used to that format. But this was deaf school, this was art school, this was pop music, this was a different thing, and we had a very big following of deafers who dressed up. They looked fabulous, actually. We had three girls who had bright blue dresses on, with great big swing skirts and hats, and the spotlight went on them. And we had lots of people in the audience who'd come with us from Liverpool. And so that was exciting to see them out there. And we'd been through the heats, and that had been pretty darn dull, uh, because it had just been the bands and not really the followers so much. But this was all the gang together. And so the energy was really up when we went on stage. And it was very exciting. I remember singing um, Bad Habits with the group. And I'm si I'm, when I remember it, I remember all the colours that we were wearing. Um, the Bright Sisters, they were both wearing plastic dresses with notes and discs on them that were circular skirts. And they looked fabulous and they were singing really well. And the guys were all jazzed up as well, really fantastic outfits. I, I, had, I remember I had a bright red silky skirt that was shimmering in the light and um, that had notes on it as well. It was done by the same designers that, that had done the girls' dresses. And I, I just felt a million bucks in this outfit. And uh, it was incredibly thrilling to sing uh, one of the funniest th songs, Bad Habits, where they had a bit where it was about nose picking. <laughs> and it was just hilarious, you know, to be in this situation. And that was kind of the, the comedy of what we were doing all the time, that, that they'd be this sort of cabaret type approach as well as a rock approach within the music. And then there'd be jazz elements and lots of different kinds of music altogether. As I said, like the collage. And they, the humour ran all the way through it. And actually winning was really, really thrilling. And uh, trouble was, we lost a sax. Ian's sax went missing. But the band bought him one with the, with the winnings, which I thought was a fabulous thing to do. Something you just mentioned there, that the audience was part of the energy of the band. That's interesting. Whenever we had any uh, gigs, it would be real fun because there'd be people from the art school who dress up and then there'd be a whole ton of people who were family, friends, extended friends, people from the whole area of L8 would come, people from outside of town would come as well and whenever we had it, it there'd be a feeling of a party about it and very high energy and but at the same time it was always very well focused. We had some good focused singing with people singing beautiful solos and an intensity from the whole of the band that enriched the whole process, that made everybody very excited. The way that they organised the music was very carefully done so that we left on a high. And we had old standards as well as brand new work all put together. So it was a very interesting mix. And I think it was very well worked out. You know, Clive Langer, for instance, did a great job of organising the music and making sure that we all knew what we were doing and that he planned it very carefully, I think.